Welcome to the Browning Symposium, a symposium that honors Judge James R. Browning, Chief Judge Emeritus of the Ninth Circuit Court of Appeals. Judge Browning was a distinguished graduate of the University of Montana School of Law, class of 1941. My name is Hilary Wandler. I teach here at the law school, and I had the privilege of clerking for Judge Browning during the years of night, or of, yeah, sorry, <laughs> forgot that. They're all running together now, <laughs> 2004 and 2005. Um, Judge Browning grew up in Belt, Montana. He graduated first in his class from this institution, and he was a member of the very first editorial board of the Montana Law Review. He, after he left this place, he had a front row seat to some of the most significant and volatile events in our country's history. He enlisted in the Army in 1943, served in military intelligence in the Pacific Theater during World War II. He earned a Bronze Star for his service. He served with distinction in the Department of Justice Antitrust Division and also as a private practitioner. He argued some notable cases before the US Supreme Court. After arguing Brunner versus the United States, he actually received a personal handwritten note from Justice Jackson that Jackson and others on the bench that day thought his argument was wholly admirable. In 1958, Chief Justice Earl Warren appointed him to be clerk of the United States Supreme Court. He took office, office during the aftermath of Red Monday and in the midst of feverish efforts to impeach Chief Justice Warren. In 1961, President Kennedy appointed Judge Browning to the Ninth Circuit, and it was shortly after Judge Browning had held the Bible for, uh, for President Kennedy as he was sworn in as President of the United States. He served on the Ninth Circuit for over 50 years. He was the longest serving appellate judge in the history of the federal judiciary. He employed 143 young lawyers as law clerks, including many graduates of the University of Montana School of Law. He had a lasting impact as chief judge of the Ninth Circuit. His innovations came because in the first decade he was on the bench, the number of appeals filed increased by sevenfold, and Congress started challenging the circuit and saying it should be divided. He put into place administrative innovations, a limited en banc procedure, and other tools, all of which saved the Ninth Circuit as it is today and made the entire system run smoothly. As Justice Anthony Kennedy said in a tribute to Judge Browning, he loved the Ninth Circuit. He was devoted to maintaining its cohesion, its collegiality, and its judicial excellence. Judge Browning was truly a great man of Montana, a great man of the University of Montana School of Law, and a great man of the federal judiciary. I have the privilege today of introducing for you the speaker in this Browning Symposium, Professor Ilya Soman. Professor Ilya Soman is a professor at the George Mason University School of Law. He researches constitutional law, federalism, property law, and the implications of popular political participation in democratic government. Before teaching at George Mason, he was the John M. Olin Fellow in Law at Northwestern University, and he clerked for the Fifth Circuit. He was an adjunct scholar at the Cato Institute, and he authored um, several articles. He's been published in several law reviews, Yale Law Review, Stanford Law Review, and Northwestern Law Review, to name a few. He gra graduated summa cum laude with a BA from Amherst College. He holds also a master's in political science from Harvard, and he received his JD from Yale Law School. <laughs> 
And I welcome you, Professor Silman. I'd like to start by thanking the University of Montana and the Law Review for organizing this exciting symposium and for getting so many excellent panelists for tomorrow and uh, the remaining events. Uh, I'm also welcome this opportunity to visit the great state of Montana for the first time ever. I noticed that you now have actually much nicer weather than we usually do in Washington, D.C., so uh, I, that's a surprising and good thing, uh, and I very much welcome uh, the opportunity for that reason as well. Uh, tonight, uh, I'm going to talk about some issues related to the subject of this symposium, federalism. And in particular, I'm going to suggest that in discussing issues of federalism, we don't pay enough attention to the relationship relationship between federalism and voting with your feet. Once we consider the importance of these sorts of opportunities, I think that strengthens the case for decentralizing political power to lower levels of government, and it should also affect our attitude to judicial enforcement of federalism-based limits on the power of the central government. Uh, so in the very first part of the presentation, I'll talk a little about what is voting with your feet, uh, how does it work. I'll then go on to discuss how increasing opportunities for voting with your feet can enhance our political freedom for several interrelated reasons. Uh, I think also enabling people to vote with their feet on more issues will also enhance how well informed their decision making is and how logical and rational it is relative to deciding those same issues uh, purely at the ballot box through more conventional voting. Uh, in the latter part of the presentation, I'll talk about some possible limitations of voting with your feet, which I think are genuine problems, but they're not nearly as severe as many people claim that they are. And finally, towards the end, I'll discuss the implications of all of this for constitutional federalism and for the a propriety and appropriateness of judicial review of federalism issues, particularly with respect to limiting the power of the central government. Uh, but first things first, what is this voting with your feet, or uh, as I call it in much of my work, uh, foot voting? Uh, I've elaborated on this in greater detail in my book, Democracy and Political Ignorance, that came out last year. My publisher requires me to mention that at all talks that I give, and also in more recent work about the relationship between federalism and political freedom. Uh, some publications even credit me with coining the term foot voting as a shortened version of voting with your feet. To be honest, I don't actually know whether I'm the first person to use it or not, but if somebody else got to it before me, I still want to appropriate their intellectual property and continue to keep using it. I do teach property, <coughs> real property, not intellectual property, so I feel fewer qualms about infringing on that kind of uh, property right. Uh, so foot voting, at least as I use it in my work, uh, denotes situations where we can choose what sort of government or policy you want to live under by deciding where we want to live. Uh, and for example, we can do so by choosing what state to live in. Many people, for instance, historically migrated to the great state of Montana for reasons like this. You can also exercise this uh, foot voting when you choose what city you live in or what local government. And in addition, one can vote with their feet in the private sector. We do so every day when we decide what sorts of products to buy or what kind of civil society organizations we want to be associated with, such as a church or a synagogue or a private school, professional association, uh, and so forth. Notice that although it's called foot voting or voting with your feet, in some cases it doesn't actually require any movement. In the private sector in particular, we can vote with our feet often without actually physically going anywhere at all. You can, for instance, call, pick up the phone and c get a different cable provider or a different provider of internet services and so forth. This also can be voting with your feet, even though it doesn't require movement. What differentiates voting with your feet from conventional ballot box voting is the fact that it's an individual choice as opposed to a joint decision that you make with thousands or millions of other people uh, where your vote is just one of uh, 
a great many others. And I think this distinction is the one that highlights many of the advantages of foot voting that I'm going to discuss later in the presentation. So I'd first like to talk about how within a federal system, foot voting can enhance our political freedom. Uh, Americans, almost all of us, have read the Declaration of Independence where it says that government derives its just powers from the consent of the governed. But I think too often we don't reflect very much on exactly what that means. We tend to assume that the consent of the governed and political freedom more generally is simply just reflected through ballot box voting. Uh, if we get to vote for who's in government, that means we have political freedom, and it also means that we've actually consented to what is going on. Uh, I think, unfortunately, though, that this is an inadequate account both of political freedom and also of the consent of the governed. Let's talk about the freedom aspect uh, first, the ability to choose what sort of government policies uh, you live under. In a sense, you are exercising political freedom when you go to the ballot box or choosing between A and B or A, B and C, Democrats, Republicans, whatever third parties might happen to be on the ballot. But it's a very peculiar kind of freedom <coughs> because the chance that your vote will make a difference to the outcome of the election is infinitesimally small. In an American presidential election, the chance that your vote will make a decisive difference is about 1 in 60 million. In state or local elections, it's higher than that, but still extremely low. At best, it's 1 in several thousand or the like. Uh, so with most other important freedoms, we wouldn't consider that the freedom is in any way meaningful if your chance of actually making a difference is 1 in 60 million or even 1 in 60,000. If, say, take religious freedom, if you only had a 1 in 60 million chance of actually being able to determine what religion you want to practice, we wouldn't say that you have meaningful religious freedom. Uh, if you only have a 1 in 60 million chance of being able to determine what sorts of opinions you can express in your speech, we would not believe that you have genuine uh, free expression. And I can go down the line of other freedoms that we consider to be important, but I think we get the point. Uh, and with respect to political freedom, this suggests that the degree of political freedom you have when your only way of exercising it is a 1 in 60 million chance of making a difference, or even a 1 in 60,000 or 1 in 10,000, that suggests that at the very least, it's an extremely limited and very poor kind of freedom. Doesn't mean that it's completely worthless. We'd probably be worse off without it, but it does mean that it's extremely uh, constrained. Now, on the other hand, with voting with your feet, this problem is to a great degree dissipated. When you decide whether you want to live in Montana or some other state, or whether you want to live in uh, this city or one of the other cities within the same state, uh, that's an individual choice. Even if 60 million other people don't agree with you, or even 6,000 other people, you still get to decide which of these sets of government policies you want to live under. Granted, many of you, like me, you might be married, so obviously my wife might be able to veto my choice and probably will. Uh, her, her judgment is better in mine. But even so, one vote out of two, or one vote out of five, or 10, or 15, if you have a very large family, uh, that's still much more meaningful than one vote out of 10,000 or one vote out of 60 million. Uh, so your chances of having freedom that is actually meaningful is much greater when you vote with your feet than when you vote at the ballot box. So it becomes more like the way we exercise other freedoms that we consider important, freedom of speech, freedom of religion, uh, and others, and less like this very ephemeral kind of freedom where we make a decision, but that decision has almost no chance uh, of actually making any difference. Uh, I think the same thing is true when we ask the question, is it really meaningfully consensual when we choose our government at the ballot box? Uh, it's difficult to argue that you've really consented in any meaningful way when all you've done is make a decision that has only a tiny little chance of making any difference uh, whatsoever. Now, some people argue, well, just the very fact that you voted, that means that you've given your consent. I don't think this actually follows in any significant way. For one thing, the government and still claims authority over you even if you haven't voted. If you choose not to vote, you can't then say, well, any laws made by the winners, they won't be binding on me. So if it's not even a meaningful choice in that sense, that severely undercuts uh, 
uh, the validity of the argument. In addition, even if you did vote, uh, it may be that you voted not because you've consented to the overall structure of the system, but simply because the system is in place. At least in a short run, there's nothing you can do to change it. So you say, well, at least I want to vote for the lesser of the two evils that happens to be on offer. But that doesn't mean that you've actually consented to either one of the evils in place. Uh, it just means that the choice is before you and you've decided to uh, make a decision between them, but it's not really meaningful consent to any significant degree. Uh, on the other hand, when you choose to vote with your feet, uh, you do have a meaningful opportunity to make a choice that makes a real difference. Uh, and uh, you can uh, have a potentially a wider range of options before you, hundreds of different cities, 50 different states. If it's in the private sector, even more different options. I readily grant that even with respect to ballot box voting, you can say, well, at least you've consented to live in the country as a whole. You haven't left. So that's a kind of consent. But obviously, the uh, burden of having to leave the country entirely is is vastly greater than the burden of leaving a state or a locality or of simply choosing some other option in the private sector. So while your consent may not be perfect when you're voting with your feet in the federal system or even when you're choosing in the private sector, it's at least much more meaningfully consensual than decisions that you make at the ballot box. Nothing may be absolutely perfectly consensual government, uh, but it's at least more consensual or less non-consensual, if you like, than decisions which are made at the ballot box. Uh, at the federal level. So to the extent that we consider political freedom to be an important value and not just something that we intone on the 4th of July but don't really care about, and to the extent that we want to take the ideas of the Declaration of Independence seriously, it seems like in two important ways. Uh, Foot voting uh, enables us to realize those ideals much more fully than they can be realized through ballot box voting at all. Uh, I'm sorry, ballot box voting alone. Uh, and uh, therefore, this suggests that other things equal, if we care about these values, we may want to make more of our decisions by voting with our feet and fewer at the ballot box. And one way we can do that is by decentralizing political power, more of it to lower levels of government, so that therefore more decisions can be made by voting with your feet and fewer at the ballot box. In some of my more recent work, I have suggested that this also has implications for strengthening the case for liberalizing international migration. In some ways, voting with your feet across international boundaries uh, opens up even more prospects of political freedom than doing so within uh, a particular nation, but I'm not going to pursue that subject in great detail here. At the very least, these arguments and considerations strengthen the case for decent centralizing political power within an existing federal system so that people can exercise greater and more consensual political choice uh, through voting with their feet. Now, in addition to giving people more meaningful choice, uh, voting with your feet also leads people to make better informed decisions uh, than they would make uh, by voting at the ballot box. One of the big problems with ballot box voting, which is actually the subject of my book, but also the subject of many other works by other scholars across the political spectrum, is the problem of political ignorance. People may be voting, but most of the time they have very little knowledge of what it is that they're voting about. For example, we're about to have an important midterm election for uh, both houses of Congress, uh, but a recent survey from the Annenberg Public Policy Center found that only 38% know that the Republican Party currently controls the House of Representatives, and a very similar number know that the Democrats currently control the Senate. I think it's difficult to evaluate the performance of the Senate and the House and whether you want to get rid of the incumbents or not if you don't even actually know who's in control of these uh, particular branches of the federal government. Uh, that seems like a significant problem. Similarly, during our last midterm election in 2010, most voters said that the most important issue uh, that they were considering was the state of the economy. Yet two-thirds of them did not even know that the economy had grown rather than shrank uh, during the year right before the election, so they didn't even know fairly basic facts about what the state of the economy was. Uh, another big issue that was uh, much considered at that time was the government's response 
respond to the recession and the financial crisis, uh, of which the, the biggest of those policies was the TARP bailout enacted in the fall of 2008. But only 34% knew that President Bush was the president who had pushed through TARP through Congress. More people did not thought that it was Obama, so they weren't even in a position to <laughs> properly allocate responsibility for this uh, major government policy. Uh, this ignorance is not limited to particular public policy issues. It also extends to the basic structure of government and the way it operates. For example, that same recent Annenberg poll found that only 36% of Americans can even name the three branches of the federal government, the executive, the legislative, and my personal favorite, the judicial. Uh, most of the public does not know uh, actually what these things are uh, and how they work. In addition, Many surveys show that the public has very little understanding of which government officials are responsible for which issues, and if you don't know that, it's actually hard to allocate responsibility, praise, or blame for uh, policy successes uh, and failures. Uh, now, some people might say, well, this must be a recent problem. Perhaps it's the fault of the millennial generation. Unlike previous generations like ours, uh, the millennials are out there surfing the internet and watching twerking videos and following Miley Cyrus. So as a result, they're not studying important political knowledge like we did back in the day when we weren't engaged in such frivolous entertainment as they are now. But actually, the available survey data suggests that the problem is roughly similar to what it has been in the past. If you go back 50 to 60 years ago, at the dawn of modern public opinion polling, levels of political knowledge in the electorate were about the same then uh, as they are now. It is, however, striking that political knowledge levels have stagnated even as educational attainment has greatly increased and even as the internet and other modern technologies make more data more easily available than probably ever before in human history. It's even the case that IQ scores have gone up over the last 50 years. People talk about how the younger generation is dumber than the older generation. People like to say things like that, but it isn't true actually. IQ scores have gone up. The millennial generation may not be politically the best informed generation we've ever had, but at least according to available data, they are the most intelligent generation we've ever had. So congratulations, but that intelligence for the most part has not been used to acquire political knowledge. It's being used for other kinds of uh, activities. And it's actually rational both for millennials and for the rest of us to behave that way most of the time for the very reason that I noted earlier. The chance that your vote will actually make a difference in an election is infinitesimally small. So therefore, it's not rational to spend more than a tiny amount of time paying attention to political information if your only reason for doing so is to be a better voter. Uh, and this economist call this rational ignorance. When there's very little payoff to acquiring more information, it's better to spend less time acquiring it and devote yourself to other sorts of activities that are more meaningful and more likely to have an actual effect. Now, of course, there are people who learn about things even though they have very little chance of affecting the outcome. For example, there are sports fans. Sports fans love to learn about their favorite team and also to cheer it on and hate its rivals and the like, even though they recognize the chance that they're learning information about the team and about the sport has very little chance of affecting the outcome of games. Uh, and similarly, just as there are sports fans, there are people who acquire political knowledge for similar reasons. In my book, I call them political fans, people who follow politics not because necessarily it makes them better voters, but because they find it interesting and entertaining. They enjoy cheering on their favorite political team, a party or an ideology or sometimes an interest group or the like. Uh, and these political fans, on average, they know much more about politics than the average voter. The more interested you are in politics, the higher your level of political knowledge. Indeed, interest in politics is the most powerful predictor of how much you know about uh, political issues, more so even than education or income or race or gender or any other variable uh, that we know of to put in uh, our regression equations. Now, I think there's nothing wrong with being a sports fan 
or a political fan. And actually, in some ways, I'm some of both. When I'm not at these kind of conferences, I spend a lot of time watching my favorite Boston sports teams and cheering on the Red Sox, the Patriots, and so forth. So I have no problem with sports fans. I don't necessarily have a problem with political fans either. However, when you're acquiring information for the purpose of your enhancing your fan experience, often that objective is very much at odds with the objective of acquiring information for the purpose of getting at the truth. Think about the way that sports fans react to new information uh, that reflects badly on their favorite team. For instance, a referee makes a call that goes against the team. The reaction is usually, that was a terrible call. The ref must be blind, or perhaps he was bribed or on the take. On the other hand, uh, if the referee makes a call in favor of your team, well, of course that was the correct call. How could it possibly be otherwise? And this is exactly the way the political fans react to new political information. Numerous studies show that they tend to discount or completely ignore new information that counts against their pre-existing political views. On the other hand, if the information counts in favor of them, they tend to uh, overvalue its significance. Uh, it's even the case that the more you are a political fan, the more you're interested in politics, the more you tend to talk about politics only with other fans of the same side of the political spectrum. So for example, uh, if you're a liberal Democrat, you tend to talk about politics only with other liberal Democrats. If you're a conservative Republican, with other Republicans, uh, and so on. Similarly, people who are strong political fans, they tend to read about politics or follow it only in media which has the same viewpoint. Uh, if you're a conservative Republican, you may very well watch Fox News. If you're a liberal Democrat, perhaps you follow NPR or the New York Times or what have you. Uh, but uh, it will tend to be media that's ideologically aligned with you. All of this is highly irrational behavior if the goal of learning about politics is to get at the truth. As John Stuart Mill famously pointed out, if you are a real truth seeker, what you want to do is actively seek out viewpoints that are different from your own. Those information sources uh, are more likely to give you facts uh, and arguments that you haven't heard of previously. If, however, your goal is not to get at the truth, but something else, such as enhancing your political fan experience or having the psychological gratification of having your pre-existing views reinforced, then all of this actually is very rational. Indeed, economist Brian Kaplan calls this rational irrationality. When the goal of acquiring information is something other than getting at the truth, it actually is very rational to be highly biased in the way that you evaluate the information that you get. Uh, so you therefore achieve the goal for which you sought out the information, but you actually diminish your chance of achieving the goal of getting at the truth uh, and becoming a better voter. Uh, so the natural reaction of many people to hearing about the problem of political ignorance is that we must be able to solve it in some way by, for instance, raising people's political knowledge, perhaps through education. Uh, in the book, I discuss at some length why I think this is actually unlikely to happen. I'm not going to go into that in detail right now, though I'm happy to discuss it in questions. I will mention, however, that it's striking that uh, educational attainment has risen enormously over the last 50 to 60 years. The average American today has two to three years more formal education than the average American in the 1950s, yet political knowledge has not increased. This suggests at the very least that increasing knowledge through education is a much tougher proposition than we might at first think it is. One reason why it is is precisely because it's actually not rational for people to acquire political information or learn much about it, uh, so they have little incentive to use the educational system for that purpose. It is also also the case the government itself has less in little incentive to use education to inform people about politics as opposed to, for example, indoctrinating them into views that are held either by the majority of the public or by interest groups and others who have influence over the political system. <coughs> now, some scholars argue that we don't need to worry much about political ignorance because people can use information shortcuts to go around it. Uh, they can use small bits of information to substitute for larger bodies of knowledge that they don't know. There are many different shortcuts arguments of this kind. In the book, I go through probably 15 or 16 different varieties. Here, I'll just mention only one, which is the most common one, and which I think exemplifies the weaknesses of the others. Uh, the simplest kind of shortcut argument, and the one that probably has the 
the most support in the academic literature is the idea of retrospective voting. That is, maybe you don't need to know much about politics or government or what is going on with it. You just need to ask yourself, are things going better under the rule of the political incumbents or are they getting worse? As Ronald Reagan famously said in the 1980 election, all you need to do is ask, are you better off than you were four years ago? If you are better off, then you can reelect the incumbents and reward them so that they will continue their good policies. If, on the other hand, you're worse off, you can vote against them. Uh, you can vote the bastards out. And then you can vote in a different set of bastards to replace them, but the new group of bastards will have incentives to adopt better policies than the old one because they will know that what happened to their predecessors, what happened to Jimmy Carter, for example, uh, could also happen to them. So I think this mechanism can can be useful in many cases, uh, but it also exemplifies the severe limitations of information shortcuts. One of them is that in order to use the shortcuts effectively, you actually need some pre-existing knowledge. You need to know, for example, what issues the incumbents can actually have an effect on and which ones they cannot. If you don't know that, then you will end up rewarding and punishing the incumbents for things that they didn't actually cause. And this is actually exactly what happens in most elections most of the time. The biggest determinant of electoral outcomes uh, usually is the recent condition of the economy. Did it improve or get worse uh, in the six months or year or so right before the election? Even though most economists will tell you the political incumbents actually have very little control over short-term economic trends. If they did control them, they would virtually never be defeated for re-election. But in reality, they have very little leverage over it. Uh, so most of the time, the biggest determinant of electoral outcome is something the incumbents have very little leverage over. And this problem is not limited to just economic voting. Uh, it also extends to other issues. For example, in farm states, there is evidence that the incumbent governor and other officials are much less likely to be re-elected if there is a drought, even though, of course, the governor and these officials, they generally have have no real control over whether there is a drought uh, or not. On the other hand, it's good news for local officials if sports teams have won a championship recently, if one of the local teams has won. That, that's great news if you're the mayor of the city where it has happened. Even though usually the mayor has very little connection to the sports team, he doesn't usually play on the team, he doesn't call in play, he doesn't coach the team. Uh, maybe he affects the team with his moral inspiration, but in general, uh, he or she has very little impact but uh, they benefit uh, anyway. In addition, there is a second big problem with information shortcuts, and that is these theories implicitly assume that voters choose shortcuts based on whether the shortcut will be effective at getting at the truth or not. Whereas in reality, often they use them for these purposes of rational irrationality that I talked about earlier, for enhancing their fan experience uh, or for uh, uh, or for reinforcing their pre-existing views. So for instance, the uh, idea of retrospective voting implicitly assumes that what voters are doing is they're using the condition of the world to evaluate the incumbents. If things are getting better, then they give the incumbent more credit. But often what happens is actually the opposite. The people's uh, pre-existing conceptions about the incumbents affect their view of the world. So for example, uh, when there is a Democrat in the White House, Republican-aligned voters voters tend to overestimate the rate of inflation and unemployment. Uh, and Democratic voters have the opposite kind of bias. They think that things are better than they actually are when a Democrat is in the White House, but worse than they actually are when it's a Republican. And I think this reflects the kind of rational irrationality bias that uh, I was discussing earlier. So ultimately what we have here is a two-level problem of political ignorance. Most of the public is simply rationally ignorant. They don't pay much attention to the issues and therefore they have very little understanding of what they're voting on. There is a minority, the political fans, who know a lot more, but those people tend to be highly biased in the way that they evaluate the information that they learn, so they get much less truth-seeking benefit from it than they would if they evaluated it in an unbiased way. So what can we do about this? Uh, well, as I suggested at the very beginning, making more of our decisions by voting with our feet and fewer by voting at the ballot box can help with this problem. And it can help it for the very same reason that it can help us enhance our political freedom. When you vote with your feet, you have much better incentives to become informed about your decision than when you vote at the ballot box. <coughs> 
If you are like most people, you probably spent more time acquiring relevant information and studying it the last time you bought a car or a TV set than the last time you decided who to vote for for president or for any other political office. Now, is this because your TV is more important than who holds the presidency or perhaps because it deals with more complex issues than whoever is in the White House? Unless you have a very unusual TV set, I think that's probably not the reason why you spent more time searching for the TV set than deciding who to vote for for president. The real reason for most people, I think, is that when you made the decision about the TV set, you knew that it would actually make a difference. Whatever choice you made, whether it was Sony or Toshiba or something else, that actually probably will be the TV that you actually will have in your house. Whereas on the other hand, when you decide to vote for Obama versus Romney or the Democrats versus the Republicans, the chance it'll make a real difference, the outcome is infinitesimally small. So quite understandably, you take that decision much less seriously, even though in many ways it's a more important decision in terms of its impact on the world. In some cases, it may even have a greater impact on your own personal life than does uh, whether you get a Sony TV set or one made by some other corporation. Uh, this is true not just for your incentive to acquire relevant information, but for your incentive to evaluate that information in an unbiased way when you do earn it. Uh, so consider the following social norm that I at least have run into on occasion and probably you have as well. You are not supposed to argue about politics in mixed company. If you come up to somebody and you start explaining to them why their political views are wrong, they probably won't react in a very positive way positive way. Indeed, even if you have totally devastating arguments and evidence that they have never heard of before that completely destroy their pre-existing viewpoint uh, and explain definitively why they were wrong, amazingly enough, they probably will not thank you for correcting their mistakes. Indeed, in many cases, they will react in quite a hostile way. So if you want to be a popular sort of person that's well-liked and that's invited to all the cool parties, you don't want to be the kind of person that's constantly criticizing other people's political views. Believe me, I know from painful personal experience that is not the kind of reputation uh, that you want to have. On the other hand, uh, if you come up to those very same people and you give them new information that's relevant to a foot voting decision, such as what car to buy or what community to live in, in general, their reaction will be quite different. They won't always be grateful, but they usually will take seriously what you're saying uh, and certainly won't react with the kind of hostility that political arguments uh, are often met with. Now, why the difference? I think the difference is this. Uh, for most people, having their political views criticized is all pain for very little gain. Uh, they have the pain and discomfort of having their cherished beliefs criticized, and that pain may actually be even greater the stronger your arguments are, because then they're embarrassed for seeming stupid or illogical compared to the critic. Uh, on the other hand, the gain is very small. At best, you make a better decision with respect to a choice that is unlikely to make any difference anyway. Uh, on the other hand, when you get more information that's relevant to a foot voting decision, that's information you can actually use. Uh, you might buy a better TV. You might make a better choice about where you're going to live. You might send your kids to a better school, uh, and so on and so forth. So uh, you're going to pay closer attention. You're going to try harder to control your biases. You won't always succeed. Uh, I certainly don't claim the consumers are all like Mr. Spock in Star Trek where they're completely rational in their evaluation of the new information they get. But in general, we're more logical and less biased when we evaluate foot voting information than when we evaluate political information. And indeed, both historically and today, there's a lot of evidence that foot voters do a better job of acquiring and using information, even under very difficult conditions, than ballot box voters do. Uh, a great example from American history is the case of African Americans in the Jim Crow era South, where we had a population that was severely oppressed. Most of them had very low levels of education, and southern state governments actually deliberately tried to keep them ignorant about how conditions 
conditions for African Americans were relatively less bad in the North and in the West. Nonetheless, millions of African Americans did learn the relevant information and did migrate to the North and the West and significantly improved their situation. Sadly, it did not put an end, at least not for many years, to the problem of racism, but it did at least manage to make their situation significantly better than it would, was otherwise. Uh, and it's a dramatic example of people finding out relevant information for foot, for foot voting, even under highly adverse conditions. Another good example, the movement of immigrants in the 19th and early 20th century from uh, Europe and Asia to the United States. Many of these people were also poorly educated. Many were illiterate. In those days, they didn't have the internet, so you couldn't simply Google economic conditions in the United States to find out that opportunities were better than they were in your home country. But nonetheless, tens of millions of people did acquire the relevant information uh, and acted accordingly. Uh, and there are similar examples today, some of which I discuss uh, in detail in the book of dramatic situations where foot voters do pretty well even when the conditions are bad. Uh, of course, today, the conditions for effective foot voting are actually much better than they were a century ago. Moving costs are lower because uh, transportation is easier than it was previously. And in addition, people have more education, so they can more easily assimilate new information. Their IQ scores are higher than they were before. I mentioned that earlier. They have more raw intelligence. Uh, and uh, the internet and other modern technology make information much easier to find than it was before. Uh, unfortunately, ballot box voters have taken very little advantage of all of these types of developments for the reason I mentioned earlier. It's not rational for most people to spend a lot of time acquiring relevant information to vote at the ballot box. On the other hand, when it comes to foot voting, uh, there's much better incentive to take advantage of these opportunities, uh, and therefore, in many ways, foot voting can be even better today uh, than it was 50 or 100 years ago when the ancestors of most of the people who currently live in the United States uh, took advantage of it successfully uh, and moved to this country. Now, of course, there are important uh, constraints and limitations of foot voting as well. Uh, nothing is perfect and certainly uh, foot voting isn't. Uh, in this talk, I'll just mention and discuss a few of the constraints and limitations that are most often cited in the literature. The most obvious one is the problem of moving costs. If you're going to vote with your feet by moving to a different state, that can be costly, not just in terms of the money you spend to actually move. You might have to give up your job. You might lose ties to your family or friends. I know of people who moved and then their girlfriends or boyfriends ended up breaking up with them. That is a genuine cost and you know it's a real problem that might deter you from uh, foot voting or may, may even make it impossible. Uh, I think this is a real limitation, but it's not as severe uh, as people often think it is. It hasn't prevented some 43% of Americans from making an interstate move at least once in their lifetime, and almost two-thirds of Americans have at the very least made a move within a particular state. Moreover, to the extent that uh, moving costs are a genuine problem, it actually argues for greater decentralization than you would have otherwise. So for example, uh, moving from one town to another is cheaper than moving from one state to another. Uh, and moving from one state to another, of course, cheaper than moving to a foreign country. And if the issue is decided in the private sector and not through government, often you can vote with your feet without any significant moving costs at all. You can simply live in the same place you lived in before, but switch service providers or the like. So uh, in many ways, the way to deal with the problem of moving costs often is actually to decentralize more and therefore reduce those costs. Uh, the second big argument that is often used against foot voting is the problem of the race to the bottom. Uh, so yes, maybe people can vote with their feet, but businesses can vote with their feet too. And businesses are who state and local governments really want to attract. They're the ones who pay taxes and who the uh, local governments and the state governments really want around. So what will they do? Well, what they'll do is they'll attract businesses by giving them special privileges which are harmful to everybody else. 
So for example, uh, this argument is often advanced in the area of environmental regulation. The businesses, what they want to do is they want to be able to pollute as much as they want. Uh, and so in order to attract them in, state and local governments will reduce or eliminate environmental regulations. And then the businesses will enter and they'll pollute a lot. That will be good for the businesses, but it will be terrible for everybody else. Other people will have choices, perhaps, but all of those choices will be places where the air is unbreathable and the water is undrinkable and things are generally awful and terrible. So uh, the foot voting opportunity might then be illusory for everybody but uh, certain big businesses. Uh, I think this race to the bottom argument, uh, it does apply in certain instances, but for the most part, I think it is hugely uh, overblown. It is overblown because it ignores uh, several important things. One is that state and local governments don't just want to attract businesses, they want to attract individual taxpayers as well. And taxpayers care about things like environmental quality. They're less likely to want to move to an area where the uh, air is difficult to breathe or the water is undrinkable or it's otherwise environmentally unsound than to an area where things look nice as they actually do here in Missoula, Montana. Uh, you know, I don't see very much unbreathable air here. And that's actually attractive to people who want to move in, people who uh, pay tax revenue to the state and local government. And state and local governments, when they compete with each other, are sensitive to that consideration. Moreover, even many businesses actually want good environmental conditions because they want to be in places where the types of people they want to hire want to live. If the air is unbreathable or the community is otherwise environmentally degraded, either people won't want to move there or to get people to move there, the businesses will have to pay wage premiums to make up for the fact that the community is undesirable. And of course, businesses, other things equal, would prefer to be in areas uh, where that's not the case. Now, of course, there is a trade-off. Uh, some kinds of pollution are also environmentally productive. But in general, uh, the, the state and local governments have significant incentives under competitive conditions to weigh those things in a reasonable way, to not simply say, well, we're going to allow as much pollution as possible and not care about the consequences to anything else. From a foot voting competitive point of view, that's not going to be a good strategy for uh, most communities, uh, though certainly in some ways it's desirable that there be a diversity of environmental regulation because people do vary in terms of the extent to which they're willing to trade off income for environmental quality or for other government services. And it's reasonable that there be options uh, that people can choose from on that basis. They can thereby exercise their political freedom. Uh, the third big objection to voting with your feet that I'm going to briefly cover tonight is uh, what I think has given uh, the biggest black eye to the reputation of American federalism historically. That is the association between federalism and the persecution of unpopular minorities, particularly racial and ethnic minorities. So the concern is that Historically, state and local governments have tended to persecute African Americans and other minorities. So if you decentralize power and allow people to vote with their feet, maybe that would be good for white males, but it could be terrible for unpopular minority groups because it would just give the state and local governments free reign to abuse them in all sorts of ways. Uh, and I think there is some truth to this argument. There is no doubt that state and local governments do have a long history of abusing various minority groups in different ways particularly racial minorities, but certainly not exclusively those groups. Uh, however, this conventional wisdom about the relationship between federalism and minorities also has severe flaws that uh, need to be considered. One thing it tends to ignore is that the federal government actually also has a record of abusing minorities. For example, before the Civil War, the federal government did a lot more to promote slavery than it ever did to constrain it. Between Reconstruction and the Civil Rights Movement, the federal government also tended to do more to promote racial segregation than to constrain that. The one part of the continental United States that was completely under federal control at that time was the District of Columbia. And the District of Columbia was just as segregated as the southern states were. Indeed, on the same day that the Supreme Court decided Brown versus Board of Education, they also decided Boeing versus Sharp, which dealt with racial segregation in schools in DC because D.C. looked very much like the South in that respect. So the point is not simply that the federal government also often had a bad record, but that at many points in American history, uh, unpopular minorities, including racial minorities, would have been even worse off 
with unitary control over policy than they were uh, under federalism. Had there been a unitary policy on slavery at the time of the founding, that probably would have meant slavery everywhere, uh, not slavery nowhere, because only one state, the state of Massachusetts, uh, had abolished slavery up to that point, even Massachusetts, only by uh, a judicial decision which ruled it to be unconstitutional under the state constitution. Similarly, had there been a unitary policy on segregation between the late 19th century and say around 1940, it very likely would have looked more like the policy in the South than the policy in the North for various uh, reasons, but you can see some example of what it might have looked like uh, based on the, what happened in DC and also in uh, some federally controlled territories uh, as well. Uh, in addition, during these periods, minorities to some degree were able to benefit from the federal system by having the opportunity to vote with their feet. As I mentioned earlier, for instance, African Americans were able to vote with their feet for the North as opposed to the South, and that to some extent alleviated their uh, condition. Uh, it didn't certainly fully solve their problems, but it made their situation less bad. Uh, than it would have been uh, otherwise. Uh, moreover, today, uh, in some ways, minorities have greater leverage and influence over state and local governments than has often been true in past history. Heather Gherkin of Yale Law School has some interesting work on this. She and other scholars point out, for instance, that one of the main reasons for the impressive success of the movement for gay and lesbian rights over the last 30 years is because policy on most of the issues that were of concern to them was decentralized so they could first make gains in those states that were relatively more favorable to them and then those gains spread elsewhere. For example, uh, if we had had a unitary national policy on same-sex marriage, we would not today have 17 states and rapidly growing that have it and we probably wouldn't be talking about the possibility of a federal Supreme Court decision about uh, making same-sex marriage a right that applies uh, nationally. And there are similar stories to be told about other minority groups. I'm not contending that the opposite of the conventional wisdom is true. That is that uh, decentralization is always and everywhere good for unpopular minorities. I think that would be too strong a claim and you can't support it by the available evidence. But I am suggesting that the belief that decentralization is bad for minorities as a general rule is incorrect uh, and that we need a more nuanced approach to the issue and therefore at the very least this should not serve as some kind of general argument against enhancing foot voting through increasing political decentralization. Uh, in the very last few minutes that I have, I'd like to briefly talk about the implications of all of this for constitutional federalism and for judicial review. Obviously, one big implication is that if we want to enhance people's ability to vote with their feet so as to increase their political freedom and diminish the problem of political ignorance, what we want to do is decentralize political power to lower levels of government so more issues can be decided through foot voting as opposed to only ballot box voting. Uh, and this, in turn, I think, strengthens the case for judicial review of federalism issues, for judicial enforcement of limitations on the power of the federal government so that more issues can be decided at lower levels. In addition, this has implications for the long-standing debate over the scope of judicial review more generally. Uh, as most of you know, the most common objection to strong judicial review is the claim that it's anti-democratic, that these unelected judges are setting aside the will of the people <coughs> and their elected representatives. Uh, but once you recognize that in many ways voting with your feet is a better way of exercising political freedom than voting at the ballot box, then it may be that judicial decisions that impose limitations on the power of the federal government, that what they do is they actually enhance our political freedom as much or more so than they detract from it. The problem of political ignorance here is also relevant. Uh, recall that the concern with judicial review traditionally is that it's counter-majoritarian, it sets aside the will of the people. This is the so-called counter-majoritarian difficulty. But once you recognize the reality of widespread political ignorance, it turns out that many of the laws that judges might invalidate, they're ones that the public either doesn't even know the existence of or has very little understanding of their effects. So those laws are majoritarian in a much less significant sense than we usually assume. On the other hand, 
judicial decisions that limit the power of the central government, uh, what they can do is enable people to make more decisions by voting with their feet and thereby be better informed and make those decisions in a more meaningful way uh, than when they vote at the ballot box. Now, none of this means that we should have the maximum possible amount of judicial review. Obviously, there are many other issues that need to be considered other than the counter-majoritarian difficulty in foot voting when we decide how much judicial review we would, would desire to have. It also doesn't mean that we should have the maximum possible degree of political decentralization. Obviously, political freedom, political ignorance, and foot voting, they're not the only issues that we want to consider in deciding the appropriate size and centralization of government. Uh, but what these points do suggest is that if you take political freedom seriously and you take political ignorance seriously, you should support more decentralization and tighter limits on federal government power than you yourself would be in favor of in a world where you thought political ignorance was not a serious problem or in a world where somehow voting at the ballot box was a more meaningful exercise of political freedom uh, than it actually is. So at the end of the day, even if you agree with all of my arguments, you read my book, you still might not be in favor of as much decentralization as I personally would support, but you would favor more than you yourself would support in a world where you didn't think these issues uh, were a problem. Even more generally than that, I think foot voting and political freedom are issues that we haven't given enough consideration to in debates over federalism and also in debates over constitutional theory more generally. In my work over the last several years, I've tried to plug some of these holes in the literature, but there's a lot more work that can be done, and perhaps some of you will go out and help do it and contribute to what I think is an ongoing and very important debate. So on that note, I conclude, but I thank you for the opportunity, and I very much look forward to your questions. Thank you. Uh, should I call on people or uh, somebody else going to? Should I introduce myself? Sure. Uh, so I'm Abby Moncrief. I'm a professor at BU and um, on a panel tomorrow. So, um, so, so I, at the very end, you hedged your theory just enough to make it sort of like, well, I can't exactly argue with the premise when you hedge it and say like, oh, there are values to centralization too, so uh, so you just have to like find the right balance that you sort of believe in, and this is just to illuminate one virtue of federalism, which of course I agree. This is the Tibu theory. I think it's great. I'm, I myself am a foot voter, having moved from Dallas to Boston um, very intentionally. Although I will note that. For the most part, when I moved from Dallas to Boston, I was not particularly informed on the policy bundles of each place. It was more a sort of feeling of cultural fit than uh, and truly informed choice about the government under which I wanted to live. Um, <clears throat> so that's one, one point that I want to push back on a little bit, is that there are so many elements that go into a choice about where to live that and 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 even what car to buy though that's a different kind of choice I think than the one that you want to focus on when you're talking about federalism. So when you're thinking about uh, Tibu theories of shaping policy, um, the fact that I care about the climate in a particular state when I'm choosing where to live um, undermines a little bit the claim that foot voting will be so powerful for um, making political choices work better. Uh, and, uh, and I also just want to push back on this, like the, the theory would, as you're talking about political freedom, would argue for um, reduction to the individual level for policy setting, and you obviously don't want to argue in favor of that. So then when you're talking about how to set a line between centralization and decentralization, and you say, well, I want the judiciary to be more involved because the counter-majoritarian difficulty is overblown, um, I'm not sure that those two things necessarily go together. My objection to judicial review for myself, anyway, doesn't have anything to do with the counter-majoritarian, well, it doesn't have as much to do with the counter-majoritarian difficulty as it has to do with the fact that setting that line is really hard, and nine elected judges are not very good at it. So, uh, so when I'm just thinking about how much centralization do I want versus decentralization, I'm not sure that I want to trust that decision to the judiciary instead of just letting the messy political system figure it out for itself. <laughs> 
So there's about four different significant issues there. Let me try to yes. unpack them uh, and answer them in turn. One is you say, well, maybe I hedge my best too much. I say, well, there's other considerations are relevant too. So what does your argument really mean? Uh, it's true I could instead have done a presentation or a book about what should be, here's a general theory of government and what its role in society should be and how government should be organized. Maybe someday I will write that book, but not yet. Uh, but I do think that political freedom, political ignorance, uh, voting with your feet are important considerations that should weigh heavily uh, on one side of a scale, even though they won't always overbalance all alternative considerations. Moreover, it may affect how we weigh those other considerations. For example, we might think, well, we want federal power so that the federal government can solve problem X, which otherwise won't be solved. But you have to ask yourself, will the federal government in fact solve problem X in a world where voters are ignorant and don't know very much about that problem themselves? and the like. So po the problem of political ignorance should lower our confidence in the ability of government to solve complex problems that the voters don't understand very well and to make the sorts of complex choices that you said that the uh, judiciary may not be very good at making. Uh, now the second point you, you raise is, well, when people move, often they move for all sorts of reasons other than just uh, the policies that they might live under. They might like the climate in Texas, even if they don't like the government policies. They might feel a cultural affinity with the people who live there, even if they think their political views are stupid, uh, and so on uh, and so forth. Uh, I have two kinds of responses to that. One is some of the things that people assume are not really related to politics actually are. So for instance, when I've given this talk and talks about this issue in the past, people say, well, when I moved, it was because of employment and housing opportunities. I didn't really move for the politics. But of course, uh, the employment and housing opportunities are heavily affected by state policies. One reason why Texas is attracting migrants is because housing is cheaper there. And the housing is cheaper there in large part because they don't have the kind of of rigid zoning that many northeastern cities have. So government policies are affecting that, even if people don't think carefully about how they are affecting it. But it's true there is still some bundling with things that are not related to policy or not very much related to it, and that is an obstacle. Uh, but as I suggested in the talk, this is the kind of obstacle that can be reduced through greater decentralization. If we decentralize power to more local levels, then there may be many more choices available to you in communities that also have the kind of non-policy variables that you like, such as uh, a better climate, more cultural affinity, uh, whatever else it is that uh, might interest you. So there won't ever be completely perfect costless choice, at least I don't expect that to occur in the foreseeable future, but we can diminish these costs uh, and greater decentralization uh, helps us to uh, do that. Now, on the question of judicial review, you raise the objections, maybe judges won't be very good at drawing the lines. Uh, and of course, there's an extensive debate which I've contributed to in some other writings about what kinds of lines judges will be good at drawing. I suggest <laughs> that often it may be better for judges to draw more clear and precise lines. They'll be better at doing that than that sort of complex balancing formulas and the like. Uh, but we have to weigh this against the uh, problems that political systems have in drawing lines, particularly when the political system is heavily influenced by uh, ignorant voters. At the very least, uh, the political system may draw the line better when the political system is more subject to foot voting pressures and therefore to people making decisions uh, in a better uh, informed way. Finally, you say, well, what about De decentralizing to the level of the individual. And I think maybe you misinterpret my argument a little bit in that I do, in fact, favor in many cases decentralizing to the level of the individual. The ultimate decentralization is actually to individuals making decisions and not state and local governments making decisions. I mentioned uh, already in the talk the uh, possibility of foot voting in the private sector. So uh, all these problems of both political freedom and consent and also information variables and alike and moving costs are uh, at their lowest at the individual level. But I recognize there might be some issues that for various reasons can't be handled in the private sector. There might be market failures and the like. So with respect to those kinds of issues, we should try to handle them at lower levels of government where there's still more opportunity to vote with your feet than at the higher level of government. So where, uh, so where possible, I, wanted, I would want to decentralize all the way to the individual level where we have to have government take care of an issue for a variety of possible reasons. I would want it done at, the, at a lower level of government that is subject to foot voting. 
Uh, I grant this can't be done for every single conceivable issue. If considered a question of global warming, that probably can be handled at the local level, may not even be handleable at the national level. But I would say that we can have a great deal more decentralization than we do now. Uh, in the European Union, uh, or in Europe more generally, there are a number of nations who are considered among the better governed nations in the world, which are much smaller than even many of our states, much less the United States as a whole. So if you think Switzerland or Luxembourg is a viable nation, and can have its own individual health care policies, education policies, environmental policies, and so forth, then the same thing is true of numerous American jurisdictions which are the same size uh, as those uh, European states are. Uh, so we can't have the absolute perfect decentralization. Maybe you, can, you would possibly conclude you shouldn't have as much as I personally would advocate, uh, but I think the considerations that I mentioned in my work are ones that are relevant to making us want more decentralization than we might support otherwise. So sorry, that was a long answer, but that was a long and complex question. <laughs> Ilya, thank you as always for your talk. Um, and as you know, I agree with you about the importance of state and local government, and I'm predisposed to, I'm certainly not categorically against the devolution of authority to state and local government, but I'm still struggling with a couple of issues about your foot voting argument. And I think the first one may be that the way you framed the value of ballot box voting seems to tragically undervalue the franchise, especially at a moment in time like this one when there are hundreds of thousands of people risking their lives in Hong Kong just to be part of that one of several hundred thousand votes. And so I know you're very brilliant with words and you've done a good job of sort of trying to make that seem unimportant, but I think that may be missing part of the bigger story that's worth also acknowledging. The other thing about foot voting is, as you and I have talked about before, I worry to some extent that the by shifting political power to follow foot voting, you may concentrate power in the feet of those who have the easiest time moving them. And that at a time where income inequality is a problem, we should be concerned about allowing uh, those who are most mobile, perhaps, to determine the content of local government. And the final thing I wanted to mention is that the idea of trying to solve political problems by almost encouraging balkanization by having minority groups of in, groups of minority interest concentrate in certain localities to be able to determine for themselves what they want is in some ways very attractive and very uh, you know um, I, I, I couldn't argue with it except I wonder whether it is also contributing to a problem we're facing of increasing political polarization where both sides need each other and that encouraging greater um, balkanization by viewpoint might cut against what we really need to find our center where both uh, perspectives on both sides of the continuum really are our best bet at getting to something reasonable in the middle. So uh, another complex question that raises at least three significant issues. When you have professors ask questions, they ask good ones, but they also have multiple parts, right? Uh, uh, so so, so let, let, let me take it in the same order that that you had. First, we'll talk about the value of the franchise with respect to Hong Kong uh, in China and the like. I actually, just a couple months ago, came back from teaching in China, so I have some sense of the problem there. Uh, and I agree, uh, having the franchise is much better than dictatorship. But I think being able to make your own individual decisions often is even better than having them made by a majority of voters. Moreover, if you look at the modern history of China, if you see the horrible oppression that has happened in China in the last 50 or 60 years, a lot of it, even to this day, is because of denial of the opportunity for people to vote with their feet. So for instance, China for rural people still has a residency permit system where most rural people are not allowed to move to the cities without official government permission. And there are other restrictions on it. So maybe one reason why people in Hong Kong do not want to have the same kind of political system instituted there as exists in the mainland is because of these denials of foot voting. Contrarywise, Hong Kong, relative to other developing nations, it has prospered because it actually leaves uh, a great deal of room, more of, than almost any other place in the world, to uh, individual foot voting in the private sector. They're, they have too little space to have much foot voting between different state and local governments, but the size of the public sector relative to private in, in Hong Kong is extremely small, much smaller than the United States. As a result, over the last 50 years, Hong Kong moved from being a very poor area to actually having a higher income than most Western European nations do, which is remarkable given their lack of natural yeah, research. For the I'm not saying they shouldn't be asking for the franchise. I said four things that would be under the control of government 
uh, uh, it's better to have the franchise than to have uh, a dictatorship, which is what the issue in Hong Kong currently is about, but it's better still to uh, have more of those issues uh, be free of government control where possible. I think Hong Kong is actually a dramatic example of that, including in the contrast between Hong Kong and China. So I agree the dispute in Hong Kong is an example of how the franchise is better than dictatorship, but it's an even more dramatic example of how foot voting is superior to the denial of foot voting. Uh, on the second issue of maybe uh, uh, actually, it's really just the wealthy who would benefit more from foot voting uh, because they're the ones who are the most mobile. Uh, I think the truth is actually almost the exact opposite of that. Both historically and today, the poorest people are more likely to vote with their feet than the wealthiest, and there's a good reason for that. One is the worse off you are, the more incentive and the more reason you have to try to make a change. The second is that the big limitation on foot voting that is hard to get rid of uh, is immobile assets. If you own an asset that can't be moved, like property and land, then if the local policy abuses that asset, Asset, uh, moving won't help the situation. I have actually have an article devoted to this problem called federalism and property rights. Of course, almost by definition, people who are poor tend not to have much in the way of valuable immobile assets. And that's why the very poorest part of the population is actually twice as likely to make an interstate move uh, on a per year, on an annual basis than uh, the national average. So uh, foot voting doesn't perfectly solve the problems of all poor people, but it's certainly in many ways actually more useful to them than it is to the uh, most wealthy, at least those are the wealthy who own immobile assets, and immobile assets do tend to be owned disproportionately uh, by wealthier uh, people. Finally, there is the problem you raised, is something that I should have put in my book about political ignorance, but didn't, but I will if I'm allowed to do a next edition. That is the issue of polarization and balkanization, what some people call the big sort, that what you might end up with, with Decentralized foot voting is Democrats with other Democrats, Republicans with other Republicans, and they'll be even more insular and more polarized. Uh, I have two kinds of answers to that. One is, I think what really causes polarization is the need for a one-size-fits-all policy with people who have very different preferences. So uh, if we have a national education policy, then inevitably there's going to there's be a high-stakes conflict over what the curriculum should be. If, on the other hand, you decentralize that, you lower the stakes of the conflict and you reduce people's incentives to fight. And this is true not just in education, but in other policy areas as well. Secondly, both empirical data and theoretical consideration I think actually undercut the idea that what you get is people sorting purely based on ideology and the like, uh, because people, first of all, most of the general population is not made up of, notice oh, it's hard for some of the people in this room to believe, but most of the general population is not made up of people who have intense ideological preferences. So they move for things like employment opportunities and the like that are affected by policy, but they don't have uh, a very strong desire to live with other people who are homogenous. Indeed, many people actually prefer diverse jurisdictions in part because you know, they have better cultural opportunities, restaurants, many other kinds of uh, things. So uh, it's not even actually clear, according to more recent data, whether the big sort has actually led to greater uh, ideological concentration than existed before. But even if it has led to some, it certainly hasn't led to the sort of ultra concentration that some people uh, are worried about. But some degree of additional concentration, as you actually suggested, may actually be beneficial in that uh, people can then have more of their preferences actually satisfied by the local government. Fortunately or unfortunately, however, for most people, those preferences don't necessarily involve a very rigid and consistent set of ideological uh, preferences that apply to every single issue. Uh, most people have a particular set of things that they care about, uh, and there's a lot of other stuff where they might be willing to uh, live and let live, and therefore they don't feel like they have to live only with other people who have the exact same views as they do. So another relatively long and complex answer, but that was an answer to another three or four part question. <laughs> would, would you um, comment on the impact of large dollars and corporate speech on the tension between unitary policy making and decentralized policy making? So are you asking whether uh, corporate corporations or uh, big political contributors, whether they favor uh, greater concentration of power than, the, than other interests do? Or no, I'm, I'm fairly 
I have a pretty good opinion on what that on what they favor. The question is, what do you think the impact will be? So I, I don't know for sure because it's not clear to me that uh, large dollar contributors uh, necessarily, at least consistently, favor greater centralization of government power than would exist otherwise. <coughs> Moreover, there's a lot of data in political science which suggests that uh, financial contributions to campaigns in general actually have only a very modest impact on electoral outcomes. So to fully address that question probably would actually require a whole other seminar on a different topic. Uh, but to the extent that you think that, uh, and uh, you may think this, I think, to a greater extent than I do, but to the extent that you think that the political system uh, has been corrupted by uh, special interests with more money, wealthy individuals or corporations or whatnot, then that might be another reason to say we might want to limit the power of that political system. I recognize the alternative strategy is to say, well, what we really want to do is to have tight controls over people's political spending. But notice that means that the power over campaign spending would be even more concentrated. Instead of being concentrated in the hands of wealthy people or corporations, it might be concentrated in the hands of incumbent politicians, right? They would decide. Uh, and so that it would be even smaller and in some ways even less representative elite than, say, the top 1% of the income distribution or stockholders of major corporations or whatnot. I don't rely on that argument myself because I think complaints about this are somewhat overblown for the reason the political science which I mentioned earlier. But if you disagree with me on that, if you think this is a bigger problem than I think it is, then your options are either A, give more power to incumbent politicians over political speech, or B, uh, concentrate less power in the political system so that the corruption that you discussed would be less, would have less impact uh, than it currently does. Thank you. Professor, thank you. Um, in your discussion of uh, ballot voting versus foot voting, there appears to be implied a major distortion as a result of ballot voting on the issues that are voted upon due to various factors. And so I'm wondering if you could just comment on, you believe there may be benefits to limiting the supremacy clause in the US Constitution to the explicit enumerated powers found therein in order to minimize that distortion on the issues that come before uh, the federal power. What do you mean by a distortion? If, if the idea is that people who are voting are uneducated about the, or ignorant about the uh, matters upon which they vote, um, the economy on a national level, the <coughs> political impact of, of what their votes are, what they mean, then that would imply that there may be 60 million votes out there that are placed in an ignorant fashion sure. that cause distortion in the actual ability of the central power to govern. Yeah. So uh, I think it definitely is true that political ignorance significantly alters the composition of government policies. There's a lot of data for that. I go through a lot of it in the book, but uh, I will mention that on a very wide range of issues, the views of people who are more knowledgeable are very different from the views of the ignorant, even when considering uh, other variables and controlling for them. So when you control for race, gender, partisan alignment, income, region of the country, almost anything else you want to consider on a huge range of issues, including especially economic policy issues, but also social policy issues, foreign policy issues, many others, uh, uh, there would, we would have a dramatically different situation uh, uh, than we currently do. To just mention one or two historical examples, uh, if uh, the voters were as, if the average voter were as knowledgeable as the top 10 or 20 percent of voters, uh, we would have had uh, the abolition of racial segregation most likely decades earlier than it occurred. Uh, we would have had uh, equality for gays and lesbians much earlier than it occurred. We would have free trade rather than protectionism. We would have much freer immigration system. There are many other examples that I could give. Uh, we would also, by the way, uh, just you know, assume that all of this is necessarily a 
libertarian direction, we would have uh, we would have less deficit spending, uh, but more of the government spending paid through current taxes than through borrowing. Uh, the more knowledgeable voters tend to favor that, so tax is actually one of those areas. Uh, more knowledgeable voters controlling for other things support higher taxes because they believe that paying for government expenditures through tax revenue is better than doing so through borrowing. So there is a big distortion, and as I've suggested, this does strengthen the case for making more of our decisions by mechanisms where people are less likely to be ignorant, illogical, uh, and uh, one way to do that is through stronger enforcement of constitutional limits on federal power. Uh, I don't necessarily have a problem with the supremacy clause as such. Such areas that should be controlled by the federal government, they can only be controlled by that way if the federal government can preempt contrary state or local laws. Uh, but the range of those areas uh, perhaps should be interpreted more narrowly than to <coughs> Professor Hills, you have the last question. Hi, Ilya. Um, I, I really do so much, um, but I feel I should pick a fight. Um, yeah, well, no, that, that was the but. I'm going to pick a fight. Um, what about exclusionary zoning? So the classic economists who defend foot voting, you know, of course, um, Bruce Hamilton being the most famous, um, argue that it is only efficient Foot voters only actually make rational decisions if the localities have the power to keep out people based upon their ability to pay for a house. Um, indeed, China does not bar people from moving to the hukou permit system. They simply keep, keep their citizens who don't have a permit from going to school in the jurisdiction to which they move unpermitted. And our jurisdictions can do the same thing. They can do it simply by not allowing people to move in. Now that means that, that that exclusionary zoning is actually a function of political decentralization. You can imagine a highly centralized system would require multifamily housing and lots of rental housing in lots of jurisdictions. And so you can imagine someone saying, I support a version of foot zoning, foot voting, that it gets rid of exclusionary zoning and increases mobility, but also undercuts the very foundations for what economists call economically rational moves. Because economists say, if you don't have exclusionary zoning, the poor chase the rich around the country. And people don't make decisions based upon the quality of the government, but simply the quality of their neighbor's ability to pay for services. Um, so I, I'm curious, do you support a version of foot voting, that foot voting that involves exclusionary zoning? Or do you support a version of foot voting that would involve preemption, probably by the national government, of exclusionary zoning? Um, and if you support the latter, then does that undercut the efficiency basis for the former? Uh, so, it's an interesting question. Rick and I, for those of you who may not know, we have been debating issues related to property rights and zoning for several years now, and I've benefited a lot from uh, his arguments. He even I wrote an article that's in large part inspired by a blog post that Rick wrote. Rick is also a good example of a phenomenon that I mentioned earlier. He's a person that lives in New York City, even though he really doesn't agree with the political preferences of the people there, but he has chosen to live there because New York is attractive to him uh, in other kinds of ways. Uh, now, uh, this question is sort of an interesting and complex one, and I have a couple of levels of answers to it. First of all, the inefficiency that Hamilton and the others point to, yes, it is one possible inefficiency, but this has to be weighed against other kinds of inefficiencies that exist with centralized government. So I don't think that Hamilton or anybody has shown that if you don't have exclusionary zoning, everything will be horrible and inefficient. And most they've shown it will be less efficient, less good than it would be uh, otherwise. But I think this problem, to the extent that it exists, is much smaller than the problems of political ignorance and other problems that arise with excessive centralization. So to some extent, I'm actually uh, willing to live with this. Uh, and by the way, in the era when we had much more decentralized government and still plenty of foot voting, you did not observe either every locality setting up exclusionary zoning, or even most of them, or a constant chasing of the rich by the poor around the country. So this suggests to me that the dynamic uh, identified by Hamilton, while theoretically interesting, is practically speaking much less significant than he and, or at least some interpreters of his work uh, have thought that uh, they are. Secondly, to the extent that this does occur as a problem, it only occurs because the theory is if you don't have exclusionary zoning, uh, that means that uh, the, you know, 
poor people will try to live in areas that where rich people live so that they can have the rich pay for the services but not have to pay for them themselves. And then the rich people either will have to fence out the poor people or reduce public services to an efficient level or some other uh, sorts of problems like this. Uh, if you're uh, really worried about this, uh, there are, there's a variety of strategies that can be adopted without adopting a single centralized system of uh, land use policy. Uh, in this, tonight, I, I probably don't have time to go through all those strategies, but one of them might be variable pricing of public services. We already do have that for various kinds of utilities. Another is that this is one of various reasons that to the extent we want income redistribution, we may want to have it at the at higher levels of government. Uh, uh, a third is that uh, uh, a, a third uh, point on this is that uh, this strengthens the case for privatization of public services. Obviously, you don't have these services. You don't have this problem to the extent that things are done through the private sector. So, as uh, was it, uh, I think it might have been uh, it might have been you who mentioned earlier uh, the issue of decentralization to the individual level. Uh, this problem uh, does not exist there. Uh, it also may mean making greater use of, the, uh, having greater uh, freedom for private planned communities uh, and the like. So I think this is a genuine problem, but to my mind, it is a much less significant problem than some theoretical literature suggests it is, and I think American history shows, uh, shows that. Uh, and B, it can be addressed in a variety of ways without giving up on the idea of foot voting and also without a heavy degree of centralization. Finally, uh, I, as I mentioned earlier, uh, it might have been actually just before you came. Uh, there is a problem, I think, of state and local governments abusing assets that can't be moved, including most paradigmatically land. And that does argue for stronger enforcement, including by the federal judiciary, of constitutional protections for property rights. This is this actually the subject of the article that I wrote, inspired by Rick, that uh, he may regret that he inspired that particular epiphany on my part. Uh, and I also discuss it more generally in my next book, uh, which is actually all about takings and property rights and uh, goes into this in, uh, in some detail. So it is not my argument that foot voting is completely and perfectly always efficient. It isn't. It isn't even close to it. But it's much better from an efficiency standpoint than the realistically available alternatives in many cases. Uh, so it's not enough to say, well, there's this sort of political market failure you ha that Hamilton identifies. You have to weigh it against the much larger failures on the other side.